Hello and welcome to Citizens Forum. We're filming this, I hope, on Wednesday, August the 7th. I think I've lost track of what date it is. The first part of Citizens Forum is always the Walter and Jack show. We're going to start off with, uh, this was in the Globe and Mail, front page story on August the 5th. That's uh, Monday, August the 5th. The story uh, extends down the entire length of the front page and is continued on page five. It's at, at the top, it's under the heading of terrorism. And it says, U.S. extends Mideast action on fears of major attack. And, you know, it's a long story, but in it, it says, um, the United States is extending the shutdowns of 19 diplomatic uh, missions or posts throughout the Arab and Muslim world until next weekend in response to an al-Qaeda terrorist threat that American officials call among the gravest in years. So there's a threat that, but somehow the United States can attack all of these countries, murder people by the hundreds of thousands, that's okay. I mean, in Iraq, it's estimated, I think, by The Lancet, the British medical journal, that one million additional people have died in Iraq. This was a couple of years ago because of the U.S. invasion. A million people dead. And somehow that all slips under the, the, the rug. But here it's front page news that the United States fears an attack. And then at the, down at the bottom on, on the front page, it says... Uh, the threat from Al-Qaeda and lots of people say or think that Al-Qaeda was created by the United States or is certainly Osama bin Laden worked for the United States for the CIA in the yeah. years uh, in, in the 1980s when the United States was using him and others to attack uh, the Soviet Union in Afghanistan so uh, the threat may be the worst since September 11th but a lot of people think that elements within the United States government and corporate America must have been involved with September the 11th too, or it never could have happened. So here's the Globe and Mail telling us this as if it's fact, but really none of it is fact. It's just their story. The truth, I think, is very, very different. And then at the end of the story, they tell us, we only know about this threat because the NSA is spying on everybody, so I guess we got to have it. Well, that's where you could start off. I mean, the NS National Security Agency of the United States, that's the files that Snowden broke into, isn't that correct, and, and released to the public. So, but the thing is that, and, and then you can read some things that, that went on there, um, but the thing is, is the big problem with, the, with all these security agencies, including CSIS, is who's checking them, them for, for, for being... Uh, on, and, and who and do they square. work for? Who do they really work for? Because yeah. it certainly doesn't seem to be the people. So you know, that of the all nation. articles should start out with a report from CSIS as a report from the NSA, and then we can decide whether. Yeah, like, like go back. To, you know, they, they say this is the gravest threat since 9/11. Yeah. Why doesn't the Globe and Mail ever ask a question about who was behind 9/11? And why doesn't the Globe and Mail, or any of the media in Canada, I don't want to pick on the Globe and Mail, but any of the media in Canada ever ask a question about how the steel frame buildings, three of them collapsed on 9-11 when no steel frame building in history has ever collapsed before from a fire. And you know, why were 300 firemen killed on 9-11? They were killed because they knew it was safe to go into those buildings, as safe as it can be to go into a burning a building. Point. They knew that danger, but they also knew they did not have to worry about the buildings coming down because that couldn't happen. Yeah. And yet they came down and they were all killed. Never a question asked anywhere in the Canadian media about why there was no evidence of an airplane at the Pentagon. I mean, there's no evidence of an airplane ever hitting the Pentagon. The Canadian media refuses to ever mention that. But you know, Jack, is that in itself not appeared, it appears to me that that in itself is, is part of the 
of the exercise that they're going through. I'm convinced that, that, that the U.S. government, elements within the U.S. government, not only were involved but orchestrated the, the, all the events of 9-11, uh, just based upon the facts. But the thing is that it was such a ham-fisted job they did. It was so botched. Why would they do it in the daytime? You could do it at night. I mean, there's a whole lot of questions. Why did they have to have this kind of a really clumsy uh, uh, caper that they pulled off that's obviously full of contradictions? Uh, why would they do that other than, for instance, to take people like yourself and my, myself and others that are thinking about it and, and, and to show us that even though you got the facts on us and you know we're, we've done it, you can't do anything about it. <laughs> Don't you think that could be possibly part of their... Yeah, I'm sure they must sit there and laugh. Yeah, they, you know, they just want to you know, you know, rub, rub yeah. us into that a little bit. Just let you know that you guys think you, you know, you're hip and you're going to make a progressive yeah. society. Well, guess what? This is what we can do. And I think there's an element of that in that whole... And the paper. whole thing is amazing. I mean, the bringing down of three huge towers, the hijacking of airplanes, yeah. and then the creation of one war after another with the killing of hundreds of thousands of people. And it all ends with... Well, we have to have the NSA spying us because we're under attack. <laughs> we, and, and, and then Mr. Snowden, who I think is yeah. a, a great hero, has to run away from the United States and run to Russia. Well, try I mean, this isn't, idea Isn't this on, supposed Jack. to be the other way around? Now, how do you check the Snowden case? I mean, I don't know what's going no, on there. but We have you no know, idea of anything we're saying. Who knows? But in that same vein, if you look at the NSA collecting all that data on us all these years, 20, 25 years they've been doing it, so they have all everything on anyone that they want to have. But the thing is, is that that information is not that powerful until you let the public know you have it on them. Because if they want to control public behavior, think about it, they'd have to let you know, hey, we've got you, we've, we're watching your emails, we're watching your phone calls. If you're thinking you're pulling something off, we, know, we, have, we are watching you. So the Snowden leaks could easily be just a fabricated story to yeah, get yeah. that information out to make us fearful. Yeah, that's possible too. It's just a possibility. I mean, that's the problem. You know, the, the, the possibilities extend from A to Z. They're so broad, you have to take everything into account because, I mean, who do you trust? Who, they're so devious. I don't trust anybody. And the fact that yeah. Snowden's in, in Moscow and, you know, Putin, you know, he, the, he's a great. Uh, uh, defender of democracy and fairness. Uh, he's taken him under his wing. And, you know, we know through other other sources that the Soviet, the old Soviet uh, Secret Service and the American CIA were collaborating for years. So what is Snowden doing in Moscow? I When I heard that, I immediately thought, man, this could be a real con job. And it could be, you know, it could be. Personally, I don't believe it is, but it certainly could be. Yeah. Well, you know, these are the things that you yeah. think about because we have no way of checking it. And that's our problem. We don't have investigated journalism. There's nobody going to Moscow and getting hold of this guy and really trying to get to the bottom of it. Yeah. And there's nobody even reporting the various, the various scenarios. Yeah. Who knows? You know, really, who knows? Um, you wanted to talk about a couple of things, maybe the mine that's... Uh... Well, a couple of things I just noticed, of course, I was up on Hornby on holidays, had a lot of other things on my mind. I didn't want to think about in the real world for a few days. And I see all these signs up, no coal mine. Nobody wants a coal mine. And you can think, well, what's that all about? Of course, it's the, it's the coal mine that they want to open up, I think in Cumberland. Yeah. And uh, what was the name of that? I think it's called Raven Coal Mine. Raven, yeah. And they're planning to uh, somebody is planning to open up uh, a coal mine in the Courtney area. Yeah. Um, a very, uh, you know, a another environmental disaster if they do it. Um, it's, it's moved along up to a point. Everything's yeah. on hold right now. But to me, one of the most interesting things about that particular story is that the media won't cover it. They're not reporting no. it. It's like the it's people not People are really upset. Up there. And fearful. And down here, nobody knows. It's just like, wow, something really big's happening here. And I, I thought I'd be sort of on that, but no. I didn't really think that that was that big a deal, especially on Hornby, but that is a big deal for them up there. Yeah. 
Um, you know, everybody, just, just take a look at the kind of stuff that is in the media for the next couple of weeks. And we should all ask ourselves, why does the media choose not to tell us about a coal mine being built on Vancouver Island? I, I mean, it's absolutely crazy. I think it's, uh, it's on hold right now, but who knows, you know? We well, just I think it's a know. good exercise for anyone to, to just follow any story. Get, a, get an interest in a story. Do your own investigations. You know, go uh, look online, see what's being written. Uh, you know, check uh, facts. And it's a very good exercise for anyone to do just to get to, try to get to the nub of an issue. And sometimes you can be really surprised how quickly you can get to some key facts that are not being talked about, very serious facts that are so obvious and, and, and are well established that the media just stays away from. And anybody who follows sports knows all about A-Rod, right? Uh, Major League Baseball player, top, uh, top baseball player, I think getting kicked out of pro baseball because of a drug thing. I mean, that's all over the news. Everywhere you go, A-Rod, A-Rod, A-Rod. But a coal mine on Vancouver Island, genetically engineered foods, yeah. CETA, the, the, the trade deal that Harper's trying to sign us into, none of that ever gets a mention. And, and that's the media's job. And I really think that if we can't overcome that problem, then we're just going to keep on losing. We, yeah. we can't ever start to win if we don't have an independent media. Now, how we're gonna get that independent media, you know, we got a long way to go to, to make it big enough to take on the Globe yeah. and Mail. And all the, the Globe and Mail, by the way, is owned by the Thompson family, Canada's richest. So when they talk about tax issues or political issues, do you think they're telling you from what's best for you or are they telling the story from what's best for Canada's richest family? Uh, we were talking about the NDP. They're having the um, leadership review. Yeah. Now, we criticize the NDP because that's sort of our, our home. It's you know? just so much entertainment yeah. value. You know? But of course, you know, the Liberal Party, um, you know. Yeah. I mean, they've done, they've done a lot of bad things for the people of this province. Um, they've done a lot of bad things to the people of this province. I, I think the people who vote them in don't want those things done. But just as we have no control over the NDP, even though I'm a member, yeah. and you're you know, a, a, at least a past voter, I'm sure the people who support the Liberal Party have no control over that party either. They, they all, you know, all the politicians seem to be in a different world than ours. Well, you know, there's something fundamentally missing, I think, in, in, in the leadership of the party. And I'm talking about fundamental moral values. These aren't just little nuances in, in policies. I think the, the, not only in the New Democratic Party, but in many parties, they're just shifted off of center in, in what their basic concepts of what's fair, you know, what's democratic. Uh, what we're doing now is we're just hearing, every time you hear anything from the government, you're hearing from a public relations firm. You're not hearing from a minister that got into that portfolio because they were really concerned about certain issues and was willing to drive forward an agenda that he got a mandate from in an election, that doesn't happen anymore. So, so you get a minister that had those, those sort of abilities, he'd be shifted off to the back benches and they'd shift in somebody that would just do what the, whatever the leadership needs or the, or the corporate uh, world needs. So the, the NDP, unfortunately, had a prayer pro perhaps 10 years ago. You know, to turn away from that sort of politics, get back to the real world, fire those public relations companies, the p same public relations firms that ran their campaign, by the way, the Dix uh, campaign, which was such a disaster because it was meaningless from the start. But that is what the NDP is now. It's meaningless from the start. I mean, they, I, I they, hate you know, to the say thing it. is, they could rejuvenate. There's yes. a lot of great people in that party, yes. and uh, you know. I, I mean, I'm a social democrat, I can't help it. I grew up a social democrat. I really believe the government plays a role in, in forming social and, and economic uh, uh, ish, uh, you know, imperatives and, and carrying out things that bring out better things for the people. There's nothing wrong with that. No, that's the way it has to be, and because we're seeing what, what happens when we don't have But it. now it's simply, 
a long list of apologies and reasons why they can't carry out even the more most basic uh, things for us and do the most basic uh, protections for us and for our health and our environment and all that. It, it's really gotten to a point where that's the NDP, although I was calling for the Liberals are going to disappear. Remember, Jack? The Liberals are going to disappear. Well, really, the NDP could disappear now because they've gone so far off track. They, the complete leadership all their bright and brilliant minds, all their PR flax are all so out of it, so far from reality, that most people that have a mind of thinking just can't, they just look at them and go, forget it. You can't go there, you can't support that crowd. They're just simply not worthy of, 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 of a real, um, you know, to try to rejuvenate them. Really the leadership of the NDP, including some of their chief critics and all have to step aside. They ran a terrible campaign. They ignored real issues like the smart meter issue. That they could have rode into power on the one issue of smart meters, just simply saying, no, we're going to democratize this. We're going to ask the public what they need. They could have won on one issue. Now they turned their backs on us and, and they're getting what they deserve now. Except that all those you know, all those people have yeah, got elected for the most part. They're all sitting down in, in the legislature. Oh, that's right. They're all they're all reelected. Yeah. You know, the chairs are all very comfortable when yeah. they're in the opposition yeah, 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 of yeah, the yeah. government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, they're looking around, saying, "Well, you know, we blew it, but this isn't this isn't so bad either, is it?" And that's our problem: is that they're not really going to make those changes. We just have to get rid of them. And I don't think the NDP has the depth anymore in the party, the real grassroots people come out and just really drive these guys out. Because otherwise they're not going to leave. You know, they're just going to stay there. Well, so there's supposed to be a leadership review. So, I mean, I'm a member of the NDP. Yeah. I haven't heard anything about the leadership review. I'm not getting emails, you know, being sent to me on an ongoing basis telling me what's going on in the party, what the various points of view are, what the issues are, and asking me what I think. Now, during the election, I did get a never-ending series of emails from the NDP asking me for money. Yeah. Those were never-ending. <laughs> but, I mean, and I'm not talking about me, but there's, I'm, I'm, I, I'm assuming there's thousands of members of the NDP in the province. If, if I'm not getting it, you know, in terms of information and questions about what I want, then I assume none of the members are getting it. And what does that mean? Like, who runs the party? Well, how can you review this? It's all wrong. Everything they did was wrong. It has nothing to review. The, all the platform, their policies, they sold us out on every major issue. They just waffled around on a few environmental issues. Nobody really knew what they were going to do. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a party that's irrelevant. So how do we change it? How do we, be, because the issue is fundamentally important. Yeah. How do the members retake control of all the political parties? And just get what it is that we, the membership, want. You know that guy that came on from Quebec a few weeks ago and then the whole thing that happened in Quebec was just so exciting because nothing was directed there. It wasn't a public relations policy thing that brought people out on the streets. Now we're talking about the student demonstration. The student demonstration in, in, Quebec. in Quebec. And it was wonderful because they had those core values right inside of them. Nobody had to talk about it. They knew that they had to defend educa education. They had to defend basic public services. And they were out on the streets every day, four months at it, until they finally got rid of Charest. And you know, they, they showed they had power, real power. And you know, there's no party that's going to want that to happen, even including the NDP. They don't want to lose control of their movement, what's left of it. The upper echelons of that party are happy to just let it, business as usual is fine with them. And so the public has to rise up. It's just simple as that, and they have to figure it out. But look what's happened in, in Europe. People have risen up because of this austerity, this vicious corporate yeah. attack on the countries of Southern Europe. People have been out by the millions, yeah. but it doesn't seem to change. I mean, look how far away from that we are. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you know, at some point it does change. 
some point, like in Quebec, you did see a change. It has to be situational. You have to look at what you can achieve, uh, and you have to appeal to real, the real core values that everyone has in society. And you, know, you have to compare those values with these people that are in power, and you realize, you know, they're nowhere near it. Well, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back to something I've said, kind of over and over, which is a citizens' assembly on democracy in BC and a citizens' assembly on democracy in Canada, and basically that just brings together a group of people, maybe 50 or 100, and gives them a bit of a budget. Yeah. Ordinary citizens, and 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 maybe the question can be, how can we improve our democracy here in British Columbia? There's a lot of things we can do that are going to make things a lot better. We're not shooting for, for perfection here, yeah. but we can do a lot better than we're doing now. And a citizens' assembly puts power into the hands of ordinary citizens. It bypasses the entire political system, yeah. which is good because you can't trust these people. Yeah. No, it's a very good idea. And, you know, if there's enough agreement on that, it can happen. It just simply can, it can, can be formed. Yeah. You or I could to say, okay, we're going to have an assembly and, and do it. You don't have to have an approval from the government or anyone to do that. And I think something has to happen like that. Some kind of movement has to happen in British Columbia for us to have a prayer to get back into some kind of a, a place where we have some influence on the government. And we're just not having, we have none right now. It's just uh, these guys are running amok and doing whatever they want. And that's basically the definition of democracy, when yeah. uh, the people rule. And, uh, and we're out of time. Thank you very much, Walter. Always a pleasure, Jack. And thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum.